December 1st, 1942. An astonishing chain of events would start on that day that would lead to tragedy. On the afternoon of December 1st, 1942, the tug admiral with the barge Cleve Co. in tow left her dock at Toledo, outward bound on Lake Erie for Cleveland. The tug had a crew of 13 men under the master, Captain Swanson, and the barge a crew of 17 with Captain Smith as master. The barge was loaded with a cargo of fuel oil for delivery at the port of Cleveland. At the time the vessels cleared the harbor, about 2.45 p.m., a light southeasterly wind was blowing. The weather was calm. No storm warnings had been hoisted to indicate any change. On the morning of December 2nd, Captain Leif Jonasson, the Marine Superintendent of the Cleveland Tankers Incorporated, owner of the vessels, received a ship-to-shore telephone call from Captain Smith on the barge Cleve Co. In this call, Captain Smith reported that the tug had just sunk. He said that when he had last seen her, she was from five to six points up on his starboard bow. He further stated that he could not see any of the crew members of the tug in the water, that there was a high wind and a heavy sea running, and that the 13 members of the tug's crew and her captain were probably lost. He also reported that his tow line was still fast to the sunken tug. In reply to a question from Captain Jonasson as to his position, he replied that he was about two miles off Avon Point. Avon Point is approximately eight miles east of Lorraine, Ohio, and about 20 miles west of Cleveland. Captain Jonasson then told Captain Smith that help would be sent as soon as possible. Immediately after this conversation, Captain Jonasson called the Coast Guard, notified them of the sinking of the tug, and asked that assistance be sent to the barge, giving its position as Captain Smith had given it. He also called the manager of the Great Lakes Towing Company, informed him of the disaster, and asked him if he could send some tugs out in the lake to try and locate the barge, and was told that they would do their best. Captain Jonasson then prepared to drive from his home in Cleveland out to Avon Point to ascertain whether he could see the barge from the shore. Before he left, the manager of the towing company called back on the telephone and advised that two tugs would be sent out in the search, not later than 6.30 a.m., that one was to go out from Lorraine and the other from Cleveland. On his way to Avon Point, Captain Jemison stopped at the home of Otto Wanick, the schedule clerk of Cleveland Tankers, and received two telephone calls, one from the commander of the Coast Guard and the other from the manager of the towing company. The commander advised that two Coast Guard surf boats had already been sent out into the lake to look for the barge, and the towing company manager stated that the two tugs would be out of their ports without fail by 7 a.m. Captain Jonasson and Wanick then called for the manager of the towing company, and the three continued on to Avon Point. But after driving around the point and the various beachheads and being unable to see anything from the shore, they decided to return to the company's office in Cleveland. Stopping at Wanek's home on the way back, Captain Jonasson placed a radio call to Captain Smith on the barge in order to check again on his position in the lake. He got in touch with him promptly and asked him if he couldn't give a better idea of where he was telling him that they had been out at Avon Point and hadn't seen any sign of the barge. Captain Smith replied that he had been mistaken in the earlier position given, that he then knew he was not as close to Avon Point as he had reported, but was closer to the course between Southeast Shoal and Cleveland. During this conversation, Captain Smith interrupted to say that he had just seen a tugboat coming up over his stern and asked Captain Jonasson whether he knew anything about it. He was told that it was probably one of the tugs that had been sent out looking for the barge. Captain Smith then wanted to know if this tug had any way of towing, and Captain Jonasson replied that they had a heavy hauser aboard and that they would take the barge in tow. 
After requesting Captain Smith to inform him of anything that might result in a change of this plan, Captain Jonason concluded the conversation. On his return to the company office, Captain Jonason communicated with the civilian air patrol and arranged to have planes sent out to watch for and keep track of the barge. About 11.30 a.m., he received a call from the Coast Guard commander who wanted more information as to the barge's position. Jonason assured him that the barge was then probably in tow of one of the tugs that had been sent out, but the commander informed him that he had been in communication with the Osipi, the steam Coast Guard cutter that had been sent in aid to the search, and that the master of the cutter had reported that he had seen both tugs, but that neither of them had the barge in tow. Captain Jonason immediately put in another radio telephone call for Captain Smith on the barge and asked him whether he was not in tow of the tug. He was surprised to learn from Captain Smith that he was not, that the tug had not come up to him and had apparently not even seen him, although Captain Smith stated that he had seen the tug very plainly. However, he indicated at the time that there was a very heavy arctic mist on the water and that that might have been the explanation why the tug missed him. Captain Jonason then asked if he would give him his position in longitude and latitude in conformity with the request of the Coast Guard commander. Captain Smith complied with this request, but when the position as given was communicated to the Coast Guard, the commander advised that it couldn't be right because it placed the barge too far inshore. Captain Jonason thereupon called Captain Smith and asked to be given some landmarks. He was then told at the moment the barge was heading due north on the compass, that Captain Smith could see the top of the terminal tower in Cleveland and the top of the lighthouse on the main breakwater over his stern, and that he could observe the smoke from the top of the chimneys of Gordon Park bearing east-southeast. From these cross bearings, the Coast Guard commander was able to fix the position of the barge. About 1 p.m., Captain Smith called and said that he could hear the airplanes near him, that the wind was picking up and that it was getting colder. At that time, he had cut a drift from the tug and was laying hove to with his two anchors out. He reported that the fog was getting worse and that there were intermittent snow squalls. The Civil Air Patrol began searching at dawn using Cleveland as their base of operations. Results were quick. Civil Air Patrol pilot Clara W. Livingston spotted the barge 10 miles north of Cleveland. Rescue pilot Livingston would have directed surface craft to the Cleveco were it not for an unusual event. A heavy cloud of snow descended upon the Cleveco right before her eyes. When the Livingston's radio failed, she did a very wise thing. She pointed her airplane south, flew for four minutes until she saw the shoreline, and followed it back to the airport. Though Pilot Livingston was the first, she was by no means the only one to see the Cleveco, and then see the Cleveco disappear. Shortly before 2 p.m., Captain Smith called and said that the Osipi had sighted him and was working up to the barge, that an attempt would be made to get a hawser over to him so that the Osipi could take him in tow, and that he would keep Captain Jonason informed as to his progress. He reported that it was getting very cold and that there was a violent snow squall then raging, a big sea, and heavy wind. About 20 minutes later, Captain Smith called and said that there was so much ice on the deck and over the gear of the barge that he did not think he could take a line and make it fast. At 3 p.m., he called again and reported that the Osipi had disappeared in the snow squall and that when she returned, he was going to try to get the crew of the barge aboard the Osipi and come in. Some minutes later, he called again and said that there was a great deal of ice on the barge, that the wind was augmenting very fast, and the sea rising to great proportions. A short time after, about 3.30 p.m., he placed another call and advised that he might not be able to communicate on the phone again because so much water was finding its way to the fire room that they might have to put the fires out and that would cut off the power of the radio phone generator. 
He stated that if Captain Jonathan did not hear from him during the night, he would know the reason why. That was the last that was heard from Captain Smith. The Coast Guard officer commanding the Ossipi did transmit instructions to the Cleveco. He told her to pump oil onto the water. This, he thought, might help him locate the elusive barge. There is some evidence that these instructions were received. At daybreak, more than a day after the adventure began, the men of the Ossipi found two bodies wearing Cleveco life jackets. Both were covered with oil. The men of the Ossipi were lauded for their valor. It was later learned that they had continued their search despite some frightening events aboard their own vessel. The gyro compass, a highly reliable instrument used to steer and navigate the ship, broke. The ship's steel safe was ripped loose from its fastenings, apparently without damage to any other part of the ship and some veterans of many stormy years at sea were, at various times, suddenly afflicted with a seasickness that left others unaffected. The crew of the Coast Guard cutter Crocus ran into similar problems. It burst into flames. The fire was extinguished and the Crocus safely returned to port, but she was effectively eliminated from the mission. After vainly trying to get a call through to Captain Smith that night, Captain Jonason, on the next day, about 7 a.m., set out from Cleveland in the tanker Comet to search the lake for the barge Cleveco. With a big sea running and hampered by heavy fog and mist, the Comet, after having been out four hours, sailing to leeward from the last known position of the barge, came across an oil streak and followed it upwind until it narrowed down to one point where the oil was coming to the surface of the lake. Later, two lifeboats were recovered, one from the tug Admiral and the other from the barge Cleveco. In the sinking of the Admiral and the Cleveco, 32 men lost their lives. All of this started when Cleveland Tankers Incorporated, which owned barges operated by Allied Oil Transport, bought the tug W.H. Meyer on July 14, 1942 and renamed it the Admiral. The Admiral was 130 gross tons, 86 feet in length at the waterline, drawing 12 and a half feet with a 22 foot beam and had originally been built at Manitowoc, Wisconsin in 1922. She was purchased for the purpose of towing the barge Cleveco, which the company had acquired some time before. In order to use the tug for towing the barge, it was necessary to make changes in her superstructure and quarters to comply with the three watch system and carry a crew of 13 men. The changes included cutting away the wheelhouse and moving it forward, and at the same time raising it to make room for additional quarters, adding a shower and washroom, reconstructing the mess room, installing new refrigerating equipment, raising the smokestack, and providing new life rafts and other equipment. To carry out these alterations, the tug was put into dry dock in the yards of J.A. Hendricks and Company, and the repairs were then made, with the result that the superstructure of the vessel was lifted, her center of gravity raised, and approximately 10 tons of weight added to her hull at an average height of 18 feet 6 inches above her keel. During the reconstruction, Government inspectors, representatives of Lloyd's Registry, and officials of Cleveland Tankers were in periodic attendance. On July 23, 1942, a temporary certificate was issued by the Coast Guard stating that a preliminary examination of the data from the stability test conducted on the Tug Admiral indicated that the vessel had satisfactory stability that when final stability calculations were made, a stability letter to be posted on board the vessel would be issued, and that until such time it would be satisfactory for the vessel to operate in normal service. On September 11, 1942, a further letter was issued by the Coast Guard setting forth that the calculations based upon the results of the stability test indicated that the tug has satisfactory stability for all reasonable operating conditions on the waters indicated in the Certificate of Inspection 
subject to the following restrictions. Number one, vessels shall not be operated at a mean keel draft in excess of 11 feet or at more than two foot three inches trim by the stern when at this draft. Number two, bilges shall be maintained well pumped out. Number three, tow line shall be maintained in as nearly a fore and aft line as practicable. This stability letter is to be framed under glass and posted in the pilot house of the subject vessel. The tug, Admiral, was put into service by Cleveland Tankers the day after receipt of the temporary certificate issued July 23, 1942, and continued to operate from that date until she was lost on December 2, 1942. That record was seen to favor inferences to be drawn that the tug had stability and was seaworthy. However, the official record of the Admiral's stability test was on file in Washington, D.C. This official record set forth in a paragraph preceding the three restrictions which were mentioned in the letter issued to the owner by the Coast Guard that examination of the foregoing data indicates that the subject vessel is slightly deficient in stability and the following restrictions should be observed in the operation thereof. Furthermore, expert testimony given in a later court case strongly supported the trial court's conclusion that the Admiral was unstable. Henry B. Adams, Associate Professor of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering at the University of Michigan, testified from the calculations made in the official stability test of the Admiral. The testimony of Professor Adams was to the effect that the metacentric height of the Admiral as shown in the stability test was entirely inadequate for a vessel of that type, that such inadequacy rendered the tug top-heavy and unseaworthy, and that the lack of stability shown in the report of the test was a factor contributing to the sinking of the vessel. In addition, Professor Adams testified that the third restriction contained in the letter issued by the Coast Guard to the owner of the tug that the tow line shall be maintained in as nearly a fore and aft line as practicable, practically voided the certificate of stability, and that it put the owner very definitely on warning that the Admiral was a dangerous vessel, a vessel to be handled with kid gloves in the utmost care. With regard to the tug's stability in actual operation, testimony given by former crew members is enlightening. These witnesses stated that in some time before the disaster, while coming down the Detroit River, the captain of the tug, upon being told that coal was needed, cut directly towards the Canadian side of the river without releasing the barge. When the hauser used for towing the barge picked up the strain from the side, the tug started to tip over. All the crew members that were sleeping in their bunks were rolled out and came rushing up on the deck in their underwear. The mate started to hack at the hauser with an axe as the vessel began to tip over. Finally, a fireman on the watch was able to drive a bolt out of an attachment on the towing device on the tug, releasing the hauser cable just as the water started to come over the top of the starboard rail, which appears to have been about two feet above the deck. When the hauser cable was released, the cable swung about 30 or 40 feet before she touched the water with a strain that was on her. It looked pretty bad there for a few moments. In fact, she rolled all the fellows out of their bunks that were sleeping forward there. We knew something was wrong at the angle the tug was, one of the crew testified. And we all about the same time, we was all getting to the stairway to run up when the fireman on the watch hollered down below. He hollered, come on up in such a voice that we knew something was wrong. We knew we were in the river, there wasn't no sea, nothing should make the tug tip, but the tug started to tip over. On another note, when the alterations were completed after the tug had been purchased by the Cleveland tankers, the pilot house was so constructed that the wheelsman was unable to see astern and was unable to watch the tow without either leaving the steering wheel and opening one of the doors to look aft 
or leaving the wheel and mounting a bench in order to look through a window which was placed too high above the deck to permit observation otherwise. Captain Jonason, the superintendent, conceded that it was important to a man who was towing something that he be able to see what he was towing. The shipbuilder who had performed the construction work in question stated that he had never heard of any other tug anywhere that had been built in such a way that a pilot had to leave his wheel, walk back, and step on a bench in order to see anything behind him. Captain Gilby, a master of tugs for upwards of 50 years, gave his opinion that a tug whose aft pilot house windows were so placed that the helmsman could not see his toe or toe line without leaving the wheel was unseaworthy. Moreover, it appears that in the conversation by the ship to shore telephone between Captain Jonathan, the Marine Superintendent, and Captain Smith of the barge, which took place about four o'clock in the morning of the day of the disaster, Captain Smith reported that the Admiral was about five points up on his bow and that the Cleveco was having trouble with the steering gear and so had sheared off. Five points amounts to more than 56 degrees. In the ship to shore telephone conversation, Captain Jonathan asked Captain Smith if he couldn't do something to take the strain off the hawser, and Captain Smith's reply was, Captain, I was running over there and had hold of the lever to release it, and I looked around and it was gone. The tug had suddenly sunk before Captain Smith had been able to pay out the cable. The reasonable inferences to be drawn from the above testimony are that the towing hawser, instead of being in a fore and aft position on the Admiral, was leading over her port quarter at an angle of 56 degrees, and was such a strain pulling over one side of the tug that both Captain Jonathan and Captain Smith were struck with the fact that the Admiral was in immediate peril, and that the chief hope for safety lay in relieving the strain on the hawser. If such were the case, it can only be concluded that the strain had grown so great that the idea of releasing the hawser came too late. In the court case that was filed two years later, the trial court found that the tug and barge were a single unit, a flotilla, and properly considered as one vessel for the purpose of the voyage, that except for the unseaworthiness of the tug, the barge could have reached the safety of her port of destination, and that the liability of the ship owner to respond in damages for the loss of life in the sinking of the tug carried with it a like liability for the loss of life resulting from the sinking of the barge. The wreck of the Admiral was discovered in 1969. The Admiral sits upright in 75 feet of water. While many artifacts, including the bell and all pilot house equipment, have been removed, the vessel is essentially intact. The crew quarters and galley are silted in. The pilot house and engine room may be penetrated with caution. The stack lies against the port side gunnel amidships. At one time, the name was clearly legible on the bow. However, zebra mussels now cover the bow and obscure the name. Over the years, the Admiral has continued to sink. When first discovered, her stern was well above the bottom of the lake. Today, the stern is almost entirely silted over. In July 1961, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hired a salvage operator to raise the Cleveco. They wanted her to either be moved to an area that would give more than 40 feet clearance over her, destroyed by dynamite to prevent her from being a shipping hazard, or raised and towed in for salvage. The salvage operator, J. Rodney King, had some success and managed to get the Cleve Co. lifted out of the mud and silt on the bottom of Lake Erie. The Cleve Co. was indeed brought to the surface by 2.30 p.m., but unfortunately, a squall came through and ripped some of the airlines loose that were pumping air into her hull and keeping her afloat. She sank once more at 6.30 a.m. that next morning. They managed to get the Cleve Co. up once more, but after 14 hours under tow, had to abandon her in deeper water. According to Mr. King, she was running sideways due to a bent rudder and was a hard tow. With thunderstorms threatening them once again, 
the Cleaveco was dropped. The Cleaveco lies upside down in Lake Erie's mud and silt bottom in 78 feet of water, approximately 14 miles north of Euclid, Ohio. The Cleveland's hull rises up and out of the bottom to a height of approximately 13 to 15 feet. The information for this article came from many newspapers, including the Evening Star, December 2nd and 4th, 1942, the Monitor Leader, December 2nd, 3rd and 4th, 1942, and the Evening Star, January 25th, 1944. It also came from the court summary found online. The information about the salvage operation came from the Cleveland News, July 1961. This is a country road production because history is fascinating.